to go. Uh, well, hello everybody. Before we start, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, did you knew that only 18% of the failure are, are age-related? So if we think about a simple example, we take our car every uh, period of time for uh, scheduled maintenance, and we think that with that, we are good to go, and we're preventing it to have a failure so, uh, somehow. Well, we're only considering 80% of the failures that could happen. What happened with this 72% that is left? And, and now I just mentioned a really simple example. But what happens if we're talking about a production line where a machine breaks, and then the impact it has and the cost it has is not only that machine that is not working, but the entire production line that gets affected? Well, today I would like to, uh, with my colleague, I would like to talk to you a bit, um, a bit more about that and how can we um, prevent the 72% of the failure patterns rest that are uh, left. So as they all mentioned, uh, I'm Daniela Solis, and I'm uh, really happy to be here to talk to you. And OK, my name is Rodrigo Cabello. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to be here for me. So uh, today, um, I am the artificial intelligence team lead at Plain Concepts, and also um, Microsoft um, MVP in the artificial intelligence area. So let's start to talk about predictive maintenance. So how did it all start? Well, back in the days when we didn't have any machinery, we would just build something really easy. And if it didn't work, we would just throw, throw it away and build something more. What happened? As we evolved as humans, we all, it also uh, it evolved with us the machines we used. And then it didn't make sense to throw away the machines when they break to build a new one. So then we started repairing stuff. But we would just repair it when, in the moment that the machine was broken. So it was not convenient, because normally it happens that when you need it the most is when it breaks. <laughs> so then we started to prevent that by, uh, by, by scheduling a, a preventive maintenance. Every certain period of time, we would look at our machines and we would try to uh, check that everything is OK. But what's the problem with this? Well, first of all, I just mentioned that only 18% of the uh, failure patterns are age-related. Second of all, we are uh, investing a lot of money and time of technicians that are looking at machines that are not broken. And as I mentioned before, like really crucial uh, failures can happen in between this time interval. So it's not, it's not fixing our problem. So this is where uh, predictive maintenance comes into, comes into play. So the main goal of predictive maintenance is to avoid this unplanned reactive maintenance last minute. And we also want to eliminate this cost of having technicians uh, fixing machines that are not broken. And how are we going to do that? Well, uh, thankfully, nowadays, we have uh, IoT devices, and we're able to have sensors from all the different parts of machines. And we also have uh, predictive models. So when we, mi when we mix both, we're able to achieve this. OK, thank you, Daniela. So today we have um, an example about uh, how to show you an end-to-end -end workflow and the different architecture that we have prepared today. So first, first of all, is try to collect the different historical data that we have in order to try to, to get information about the touring sensor that we're collecting. And also, we are building a machine, an Azure machine learning pipeline in order to go deeper in the different um, phases that we have uh, developed to read the data, pre-processing, train and testing, and test the quality of my model, and also register a new version of my model when my data are changing. So we have um, developed in all the solution using Databricks in, the, in this case. And um, once we have finished uh, this process, we can export our model. This, in this case, is a TensorFlow Lightroom model. And also, we can build an automatic process using continuous integration and continuous deployment to deploy this model into the different IoT device that we have connected, for example, to the different turbines. Uh, we have developed uh, two models in this case, a predictive model that is making inference all the time, and also a sensor model. We have to simulate the sensor. We are sorry, we, we don't have a real turbine here, so we have to simulate all the, all the data in order to send to the predictive model. 
Um, once uh, all the information we are sending to the cloud, in this case, we are using IoT Hub to collect all the information, all the telemetry that they are sending to different devices, and also using the stream analytics to pre-processing, add new business logic, and also try to build different reports, in this case, to show the different graph and when it's necessary to schedule uh, maintenance. So we are going to go deeper in these uh, different phases that we need to, to build. For example, in this case, we are building a predictive maintenance uh, project. So uh, my colleague, Daniel, is going to, to go deeper in the next sec section about data gathering. So the first step is uh, gathering the data. So we have all these sensors in, in each part of our, of our machinery, and we're able to uh, measure temperature, humidity, pressure, speed, and a lot of things. So the, of course, depending on our problem, we can uh, obtain data from those sensors and use it. And how are we going to obtain it? Well, I already mentioned we have IoT devices. And IoT devices come in different models, different shapes, different sizes. But basically, what all of them have is just it's a circuit board with, a, a, with sensors and with Wi-Fi ch chip that can allow us to uh, send all that data to the cloud. So once we have the data, we need to pre-process it. So we obtain different data from different parts of the machinery, and they come in all sorts of formats. And of course, because we're uh, obtaining sequences of data, well, sometimes the data is noisy, sometimes we're missing values, sometimes we have a very different range of, of values uh, from the different sensors. So we have to pre-process it in order to gain some insights from it. And some of the tasks that we need to do while we're doing it is uh, cleaning it, uh, fixing all the missing values, um, transforming the data and making combinations that will allow our model to uh, gain more insight from that data. So we analyze it and we think, oh, if we combine this and that, it gets uh, more information that the model can uh, use for it. And at the end, we have to select the features that we're going to use. Because especially in cases like this where we're dealing with large amount of data, we have tons and tons of variables, and we cannot use them all. So we have to really think about our problem and what features are the best ones to fit our model. So I was telling you that the main goal of it is to predict when our model is going to fail. But that is not it. Because what happens if they tell me your model is going to fail in one hour? I'm still in the same place where I was before. So I really need to have some time in order to change the outcome and to fix it before it happens. And, and, and for, it, for it, I need to have uh, the model uh, take a look at, at, at this process and be able to tell me, well, soon it will, it will fail. And how much time do I need to uh, be able to change this outcome? Well, again, it depends on the, on the problem we're dealing with. In this case, we're dealing with uh, airplane turbine, turbines. So uh, uh, KLM and Air France mentioned that for them, 30 cycles, 30 flights, is the time when they can actually change the outcome, when they can actually schedule up uh, maintenance and have everything working and it won't affect them. So for us, in this project, we, we decided to use this 30 cycle. So we obtain this data, and we have to split it in these defined cycles that they use. And another thing that we have to uh, bear in mind is that we're dealing with sequence of data. And if I tell you, look at the sensors today, will the machine fail, yes or no? you're not able to answer the question. You have to look backwards and see how the, the patterns of the sensors are working, and then you're able to, uh, to, to obtain a conclusion. So the models are exactly the same. In this case, we're going to focus on a time window of 50 steps back. So every 50 steps back, I'm able to predict what's going to happen next. Now, Rodrigo is going to show you how we did all the data uh, pre-processing in Databricks. OK. So let me show you. Here we have um, <coughs> a notebook. We are using Microsoft Azure, in this case, uh, Databricks. 
uh, in order to do the predictive maintenance with the different data that we have. So first of all, we try to collect all the data that we have in order to read and upload to a storage in order to read and process in using Databrick in this case. So um, you take a look at the data. There are, for example, in this in this case of the there are 21 sensors with the different information um, about the different sensors of the turbine, even the cycle of the of the turbine that of the different flies, and also the ID. The ID is going to identify the engine that is uh, supporting the uh, the turbine. So once we have reading all the all the data, we have to preprocess them. So first of all, is try to label our data. It's a binary classification in this case, or so we are going. We need to know is this going to fail in the third uh, cycle, as Daniela mentioned before. So maybe we need to tag our, da our data in order to try to preprocessing and train and learn about our data in order to predict when it's going to be um, if it's going to fail or not in the third cycle. So. Um, after that, we have to uh, normalize our data. We have different sensors with different range of values. We need to normalize all the columns, okay, in order to to normalize this kind of uh, data. And also, we can um, visualize the information that we have with the different sensor, maybe in order to know if it's um, with the range of values we have to, we are we if you can see here we have different sensors with different range of values for example uh, sensor 2 is very close very similar to sensor 3 for example we have another kind of sensors that have a constant value on 0 or 1 we are going to uh, we are not going to consider for example in this case to uh, to our model from the prediction um, also as daniela mentioned uh, told, um, before we need to uh, generate in sequences. Sequences in order to look back with the time window of 15 um, different flies that we have in order to learn about the past in order to predict the future, okay? So maybe we are preparing the different um, processes in order to, to train our model. Okay, the next step is machine learning. So a normal machine learning workflow would be, okay, we already pre-processed the data. Then we need to split it into validation, train, and test it. Test it, the, the model won't see until it finish, and validation and train set allows us to train uh, the model and see how it's going. So we choose our model, we evaluate the model, and once the model is working as, uh, as we want it, then the model is uh, ready to be put into production where, where it, it will obtain new data, and this data will, be, uh, will give us a prediction. So how do we know when the model is working good to go? It's good to go. Well, we need to choose very carefully the metrics we're going to use. Because depending on the problem we are dealing with, we have to adjust what, we're, uh, wh what we wish to optimize. So in this case, of course, we wanted our model to be accurate. But we wanted a model to be able to really, truly predict when the failure was, was happening in a turbine. But we also, as I mentioned, want to avoid the cases where we think that something is going to fail and it's not failing. So then we also have to take that into account. So the metric of precision and recall helps us with that. And then what we do is we, we mix them in F1 score, which is the harmonic uh, mean of it. So then we're able to optimize all that and be sure that our model is uh, working the way we want it to work. So another very important thing when we're uh, we're deciding to uh, do a machine learning uh, solution, is to choose a model that uh, really adjusts to our problem or to our data. As I was mentioning before, if I show you the, the sensor data of today, you're not able to know if that machine is going to uh, fail or not. So we really need to find a model that is able to uh, fit sequential data. And also, as I was also mentioning before, we want to know with enough time in order to change the outcome. So we need to be able to look back for a long time and be able to provide early warnings. So our model needs to be able to identify long-range dependencies. So some of the models that adjust to this uh, characteristic I just said is time series and deep learning models uh, such as LSTM network, uh, neural networks. In our case, we chose uh, deep neural networks because they're perfect for IoT. IoT brings a lot of data, 
and deep neural networks needs those data to understand uh, what's going on. So they're a perfect match. So what is a long short term memory? Well, it is a type of uh, neural network that is capable of modeling sequences because it has sort of like a memory mechanism where it, it encodes uh, previous steps and has a context that allows it to predict something. So we need the context, although we as humans need context. But not all the information is as valuable uh, to do something. Some information uh, is useful, is more useful than the other. So how can we uh, help our neural network to gain the, and extract the information it really needs and, and to leave the one that it doesn't? Well, they have these me three mechanisms inside it. It has an input gate where new information is able to, to go in. And then it also has a forget gate where information that is not relevant, it's able to remove it. And then, the out, the, then you have the, uh, sorry, the forget gate, and then you have the output gate, which is when you actually use your memory in order to uh, predict something. So when we approach a problem using machine learning, we have supervised machine learning, we have two approaches we can use. A classification problem, is this happening, yes or not? Or when is it going to happen? Well, it's going to happen in cycle three. In this case, we decided to approach it as a classification problem. But because uh, we want to know exactly if it's going to fa uh, fail in the 30th cycle or not, then we tag the data, as, as Rodrigo showed you, uh, answering the question, will this machine uh, uh, fail in the 30th cycle? Yes or no? OK, so let me show you the part of the um, Databricks training. OK, so as we know that we are going to use an LSTM, the problem that we have here is that we need to export our model to an IoT device. OK, so in this case, we have used TensorFlow Lightning in order to run faster our model, making inference faster in the different IoT devices that we have. Um, if you have developed uh, using TensorFlow framework, in the case of deep learning, you can use the Keras API in order to, to build your deep learning solution. And also, you can um, obtain um, a model. What happened with this model? That this model is not optimized to run in different devices. So in this case, we have built um, an, L an LSTM from the scratch, because um, if we are using TensorFlow, uh, we cannot uh, support all the multiple operators that we have in the graph. So maybe we can to export our graph and optimize and remove some operators in order to export to a different IoT device. So we, have, we, have, uh, we are using the experimental API of TensorFlow, the compact experimental API, in order to build, uh, to use the LSTM cell um, in order to um, stack the different recurrent neural network cells and then to compact in order to put in the, together. We are using two layers with an, uh, 100 number of units per each uh, layer in order to solve this problem. Uh, also, we are using, um, because it's a binary classifier, we are using binary chorus entropy and also uh, add an optimizer in order to, to train our models. Um, once we have finished this part, OK, we are saving the, um, the Keras model. And also, we are going to, uh, after we are going to finish the, the training, um, I'm going to export the TensorFlow little graph, the graph session. OK, so it's uh, very important to take into account in order to export a model in a format that is going to run faster. The, mo the size of this model is only uh, 100 kilobytes in this case. So we are making inference. Uh, each inference is taking. Uh, 700 milliseconds, or is perfect, for example, in this case, for a real tiny scenario in order to make the different inference that we have. Um, also, we are tracking all the metrics that we are uh, doing in training and the test uh, phases uh, with Azure Machine Learning. So we can uh, plot the different graphs and order um, the accuracy and order the, the loss function, and also. Uh, we can test even our model or upload a new version of our model to Azure Machine Learning. For example, in this case, we are running different experiments 
um, we can track the, the duration of our experiment, the accuracy on training, the accuracy on testing, and also if we go, to, for example, to our RAM, here, we can see different values for the um, accuracy evaluation, accuracy in training, and also all the metrics that we have. And this is the, more in the most important part. We can register a new version of our model. We can put the different tags with the different metrics that we have in order to track the different versioning of our model in order to, for example, um, see if, if it has a good performance or not. And we have to look back in this case in order to roll back, sorry, in this case, I'll put another model into production with loose performance, for example. So in this part, we can see the different uh, versioning that we have of our model in order and the different metrics that we have used in order to, to check if they are going to put into deployment or deploying the different device or not, depending on the different metrics. OK, so now IoT. Well, we have these really nice devices that allow us to, to uh, gather information, and we're able to uh, prevent uh, fa machine failure. But we want to be able to make decisions in real time. And we, unfortunately, there's still a lot of challenges when it comes to IoT. The time it takes uh, from the IoT device to measure and to send to the cloud and then to uh, predict something and, and do something about it, it's a problem. It's not real-time decision. Also, uh, we are using these IoT devices in all sort of uh, places, and sometimes these places lose connection. So what happens if we have to do something and we have to be continuously connecting by Wi-Fi? It's not possible. So how can we solve this? Well, thankfully, there's a solution now, and we can use IoT Edge. What does uh, IoT Edge really mean? Well, we are able to make the decision in the point where the device is connected to the network, the edge, where the, ac the actual device is measuring all this stuff. So then we're able to uh, extend all this complex processing and all the predictions of a model. And instead of having to do it all the way in the cloud, we're al able to do it in the precise moment. So then if we lose connectivity, it doesn't matter. The model keeps on working, it keeps on predicting, it keeps on doing everything by itself. So as I was mentioning in the beginning, we have all sort of uh, IoT devices. But we chose to use Raspberry Pi and Coral Dev because they have an REM architecture. So they're super flexible. So you can connect them with all sort of uh, sensors and they really can adapt to uh, whatever the, the, the problem you're trying to solve. OK, so uh, as I, mentioned, uh, I have mentioned before, uh, we have different modules that we have developed in order to, um, the module that is going to make in the different uh, inference all during all the time, and also sending telemetry with the, um, with the uh, to the cloud, sorry, in order to send all that we have collected, all the data, making the prediction, this is going to fail or not, to IoT Hub. IoT Hub is going to collect all the information from all the different devices that we have, and then we are going to um, pre-process, analyze the information um, after, after this part. So um, the first module that we have developed is to simulate the different sensor data, so uh, we are sending all the information to the another model that is making the inference, and then we are collecting the information and sending uh, to the cloud. Uh, with IoT Edge, uh, we can build our own uh, Docker image for um, the different models using our favorite uh, programming language. So we can do it in Python, C Sharp, Node, so wherever you want in this part. And there we can um, build a Docker image uh, upload the Docker image, and then we can um, track the different metrics and the different um, version of the Docker image in order to try that then this part IoT Hub is going to update. This is a new version of the Docker image, or this is another version of the my module or my model in order to pull the Docker image and um, update all the information without 
lose connectivity because I lose performance in, in, in this case. I'm doing sending telemetry all the time. So um, the final part is the, about the, um, the model deployment. Uh, as I was said uh, before, we have used this TensorFlow uh, lighter in, the, in this part. Let me show you. Um, in Databricks, we are trying to test in. Uh, it's, it's very important only to test the part of the model inference that we are doing with uh, TensorFlow Lytle because we are, um, we are going to lose accuracy in this case. We are, we are trying to optimize our model. Model is not the same if we are using the TensorFlow framework, but we are using TensorFlow Lytle in order to um, make inference faster. So it's very important to take into account that we have to read our data and test our data with the final model we are going to deploy. So um, in this case, we have even uh, generated confusion metrics, so sending if it is going to fail or not, with, with the different information mismatch in the classification part. So um, the most relevant here is the black diagonal that, we are, um, that is the different mismatch in the classification. So it's very important to know, for example, it's not the same as my model is saying that is um, not failing. Uh, sorry, the real data is saying that it's not failing, for example, and my model is saying that it's failing. We are going to schedule a maintenance and send a person and say, okay, it's working okay. But the most critical part here is what, what happened is my model said, uh, is the real data is saying, for example, that it's not failing, and my uh, sorry, it's failing, and my model predict the other part. It's the more critical to know, for example, my, my model is saying, okay, it's not failing, by in really, and in the real life is failing the model, or it's failing the, the turbine sensor with the different information that we have. It's the most critical part here to consider that we have to improve the accuracy in, the, in this part of the classification. So once we have sport to model, we can see the different, um, I don't know if you uh, know Netron. With Netron, you can visualize the deep learning model with the different formats. Uh, so in this case, we are visualizing the, ins the inside uh, part of my TensorFlow little model. So we have an input, an input, an input that you have um, uh, with the different sequences of time window that we are sending to the model. And also, here we have the, the two layers that I mentioned before of LSTM with the 100 uh, units per layer, and also we have to have the, um, a logistic uh, regression or this a binary classification in order to try if it's, um, it's failing or not. Okay, So this is a good part in order to try to visualize a deep learning model and with the different layers that we have. <coughs> so uh, when we have... Um, deploy our model, we are going to, uh, to save my model. We have compressed my model to run the different device. Um, we have a new version, okay? We have registered, we have a model repository in Azure Machine Learning. We have a TensorFlow little model. So can I automatize all these kind of steps in order to not update all the time the different device with new data of the different device with I, I, I have improved my, the quality of my model in this case? Yes. We can in this part. We have using uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment in order to try to, for example, build a different um, Docker image each time that they're changing my data, for example, each time that it's triggering with a new version of my model. And also, we can upload my model, for example, to an Azure Container Registry with the version of the image Docker. And then we can deploy it using continuous deployment automatically to all the different device that they have connected to the cloud. So maybe when uh, they have a new version of my model, we can automatize and deploy in thousands of devices only in, in a couple of seconds. So maybe it's taken into, into account that it's very important to have this kind of automation in order to, we, we are increasing the different version, we are improving our model, we need to update all the time in the different device. And our final piece in the puzzle, we need to be able to have the analytics and the business intelligence. So 
we build this model, but this model is only valuable if we're able to act in critical situations. So we need to provide a uh, user interface where we can see all the real-time uh, processing of the model, all the predictions, all the sensors, and everything that is happening. So once we have the device, the device is connected to the cloud, in this case, uh, IoT Hub, and we have all the analytics. And what we did is we created a job that is continuously uh, uh, connecting all the streaming analytics data into a Power BI. So then we're able to see all the sensors and all the information in a very uh, nice way and organized way that, we, that provides us with the insight that we need in order to act on critical situations. And with this, we sort of explain all the architecture. And just to wrap it up, we have historical data from uh, an airplane turbine. We're able to uh, pre-process the data, train a model with it, and then uh, deploy that model. We want to deploy that model in the IoT device. So for it, we need to use uh, TensorFlow Lite. And once we have the model working, the model is predicting, but at the same time is sending all the information to the cloud where we can actually see what is going on and we can uh, uh, act on it. And now we would like to show you the device working in real time. So in this part, we are showing the different information that we have. We have um, the different telemetry of the different sensor, in this case, only free sensor. And the, line, the yellow line is making the different prediction. With there is no yellow line, it's not doing the different prediction that we have. And the, with it have a value of free, it's making programming, it's necessary to schedule a maintenance. And we have the value of two, it's not necessary to schedule a maintenance. We are grouping all the information in order to different sequences, or is this, it's faster in, in, in this case. So maybe we have to um, take into account that this, in the real case that we are using, we need to collect all the information with the different flies. We are, uh, here we are grouping by the different uh, cycles that we have in order to show you what is uh, she, uh, seeing a person that is needs to schedule a maintenance in order to try to do this. His all, all is working. Uh, uh, all is working and it's not necessary to predict a maintenance uh, or not in, in this part. So um, this is all that we have to, to say about the different, uh, the different part. We have the end-to-end -end cycle, and we are going to show you the different uh, scenarios that we have uh, developed. So I don't know if you have um, any questions. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, it was uh, really interesting. Mm, I'd like to ask, uh, have you tried this approach for uh, solving uh, regression tasks? Uh, like um, uh, which day uh, turbine uh, will fail? Yeah, yeah, of course. This is the, the, um, as Daniela mentioned before, we can solve this problem using, for example, in this case, only take a look on the third, on the third th cycle, and only because we have uh, information about this, the, the number of cycles that is going to fail, we can convert this problem to a regression uh, problem in order to to predict the s exactly the cycle that is going to to fail. Or turbine, but this is very interesting to take a look at the other, other um, airplanes companies. In order, for example, that Daniela mentioned before, KLM. In order that this um, taking a look only to the certain cycle in order to solve uh, the problem, but maybe we can convert it uh, perfectly this part onto a regression problem in order to know the number of cycles or that we need to predict. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a uh, uh, really difficult task. <laughs> Looks like a regression problem. Not it, <laughs> it's more about data. In this case, you have the exact number. So then you're able to teach the mm -hmm. model to predict that number. Of course, if we only have a, a task that it says it failed or it, don't, it doesn't fail, then in this uh, situation, we wouldn't be able to do it. Mm -hmm. So we sort of transform the data from a normal data that would be a regression problem into a classification. So basically, it all depends on the data. If you have the data, you're able to do a regression. Uh, of course, also depends on what you want to optimize. But in this case, if you have the data, you can do it. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, thank you.